All righty, everyone, uh, welcome to the Clean Fuel Summit. If you, this is your first session of the event, welcome. And if you are returning from another session, uh, I apologize, you will hear the beginning again, but I will breeze through it. Uh, so I just want to give a really quick thank you before we jump into the content of this presentation. I um, want to give a quick thank you to our two corporate sponsors for this summit, Intergy and Amerigas. They're also both dues-paying members of Louisiana Clean Fuels, so we appreciate all of the support um, and all the work that we do. And then we also have our supporting sponsor for this event, FuelsFix. FuelsFix.com is a Clean Cities run publication about alternative fuel vehicles and infrastructure and projects. And it is an absolutely great resource if you want to subscribe to a great monthly newsletter and learn about uh, what's happening in the industry. And we occasionally write there as well. So there are a couple of articles that I have written and that we have written at LCF that you can find there if you want to read some of those. So today um, in this session, we're going to talk a little bit about different clean transportation solutions for ports. Um, and I think this is incredibly important in, here in Louisiana, especially because we are really a state defined by our ports and our waterways and, and all the shipping that happens here. And New Orleans is an incredibly important port. Um, and you know, we, we have all our waterways in Louisiana that have really contributed to the growth of our state and our industrial sector. So it's very, very important when looking at these and uh, clean transportation in general, in general, that we focus on ports and make sure that we um, support those industries as much as possible in this kind of transition to a cleaner future. Um, and then just furthermore from that, uh, you hear a lot today from the different presentations about why ports are such an attractive option for many of these technologies. It's, there's lots of idling at ports, lots of short road, short trips that make it really attractive for some of these technologies, lots of off-road equipment and lots of stationary stuff that can be uh, easily electrified or moved towards uh, biofuels, propane, natural gas. It's a really good kind of robust sector for these technologies that fit really, really well in the existing use case and then as the technologies mature um, more and more, it'll just get better from there. So a little bit of background about Louisiana Clean Fuels and our sister coalition, Southeast Louisiana Clean Fuel Partnership. We are Clean Cities Coalitions. Um, oh, sorry, we have our, we're Clean Cities Coalitions and I'll talk a little bit about what that means in just a second. Um, and we're hosting the summit together. Uh, this is the, like the third time we've gone through this. So jumping ahead is kind of common. Uh, I'll try to stay on task this time around. Um, and we do have one more session later on today, which we'll talk about at the very end. We have our great panelists today. We have Matt Meyer with Sales and Business uh, Development at Daynar. He's going to talk a little bit about their equipment and what they offer and some of the off-road technologies that are available. Richard Biedenharn, Project Manager of Shore Power and Electrification at Intergy, and talk about Shore Power, which is a great technology that is used in many uh, fleets across Louisiana and is being adopted more and more as time goes on. And then Mary Till, Director of Business Development at Sawatch Labs, and talk a lot about the data modeling and, and some of the cool stuff that you can learn from all of your data at your ports and try to make your uh, operations more efficient. And to now the background about Clean Cities, uh, we are a national network of coalitions across the country. You're probably familiar with us if you're on the summit, um, but our main goals are to build partnerships and advance affordable domestic transportation fuels and technologies, moving towards alternative fuels, integrating them into our transportation network as efficiently and effectively as possible to move towards domestically sourced fuels like natural gas, propane, electric vehicles, um, as well as reducing emissions in the process and also reducing costs. Uh, everything we do is uh, very cost oriented and making sure that we can bring those prices down and reduce overall costs of fleet operations. It's very, very important in clean cities. So how do we fit within the Department of Energy? We are um, under the technology integration arm of the Vehicle Technologies Office. So the, the hierarchy tree of Department of Energy is very, very complicated, but the key point here is that we're under technology integration because that's really where we sit is getting these technologies into consumers' hands, getting them on the road and making sure that they work really well and effectively the first time around because it's very easy to get a bad taste in your mouth after one bad experience and write off the entire industry. And we want to really make sure that that doesn't happen at all. And we bring those barriers down to make adoption work as well as possible the very first time we try it. The four goals of the Vehicle Technologies Office and why we exist here are to improve energy efficiency overall, to increase domestic energy security by moving towards domestic fuels. We are more insulated from effects um, outside of America, which is very uh, valuable. Reducing operational costs for consumers and businesses. You know, a lot of these alternative fuels come from or come with lower operational costs, and especially a lot of the efficiency measures such as idle reduction and um, route optimization. Those all come with a great um, savings in terms of cost. 
and then improving the global competitiveness of the U.S. economy by moving towards domestic fuels and domestic manufacturing with these alternative fuel vehicles. And we have a very, very diverse portfolio. We work everything from light, medium to heavy duty vehicles, um, alternative fuel and renewable fuels, as well as the infrastructure associated with them. We do a lot of work with off-road vehicles, which is a lot of discussion today. We do a lot of work with non-technology non solutions, such as just idle reduction through driver training or fuel economy improvements through driver, driver training or telematics or any of those solutions that can help just generally improve the efficiency of a fleet's operations. And then new mobility choices and emerging transportation technologies, such as uh, ride share, this could, could become a big thing recently. Um, there's a very, very big change in transportation to autonomous vehicles, um, light synchronization, all those sorts of technologies. We play a role in that as well. And then we are a national network of clean cities coalitions. Uh, here at the summit, we're representing two coalitions here in Louisiana, uh, us and in the Southeast Louisiana Clean Fuel Partnership in the greater New Orleans area. But there are about 75 coalitions across the entire country, uh, making or con containing in our territories over 80% of the US population. And if you're outside of a territory, for one reason or another, we're happy to still work with you. We're not territorial. We don't, we're not bound by our territories. That's just where we operate best. And this allows us to really be boots on the ground, local support for any projects, because we understand the area. Uh, we're all Louisiana natives here at LCF, uh, or most of us are at the very least. Uh, so we, we, know, we know what's happening here. We're not coming in from Cincinnati and trying to apply those solutions to Louisiana. We're boots on the ground locally to provide support as best we can. And then um, I think my last slide is just here, just kind of building these relationships and strengthening the markets. It's really a lot of connecting fleets with the providers and the industry partners and actually getting, uh, making those, those really key connections with the technologies to make sure that we're having really robust economy and ecosystem of technologies being applied and of partners in these projects getting a fleet in another fleet's hands and getting those connections, you know, somebody who's already done a project and getting them talking to a new person who's interested in a project is one of our key solutions or the key ways that we, um, we kind of make these connections and, and solve the problems because people who are actually doing it know the best in terms of what's working, what's not working. And we try to make those connections early and make them often so that we can work on these projects, make sure that they work really well. And I know you heard a little bit about that if you were in the grant webinar earlier today, we're making those connections is one of the most important things in any project like this. We also offer training and information um, like this webinar, as well as first responder tra safety training to make sure that these vehicles are safe when they're on the road. We don't want to make a dangerous situation, uh, technical assistance, identifying funding. We had a whole grant webinar earlier today, um, general outreach and public awareness, and then collecting data and tracking progress. We wanna make sure that we understand what's working and what's not working so that we can stay up to date as much as possible. And so that's it from me for a while. Uh, next we can hear from Mary Till, Director of Business Development at Sawatch Labs. Mary, please take it away. Hi there, thank you, uh, Tyler and Anne, for having me today to speak. Um, always a pleasure to be with this group. Um, today, I'm hoping to spark some conversation around port electrification um, from the vehicle lens. So thinking about all of those vehicles and assets that operate in the port area or may go to and from the port, um, that's where my focus is gonna be today. Um, I'm going to start by just sharing a little bit about our company so you understand maybe why I was asked to speak today and what we're up to. Um, so we really believe that all decisions around the fleet should come from a robust data set of real vehicle activity, day-to-day um, -day analysis of the way vehicles and assets are being operated so you can make the best decisions possible. Um, in today's context, I'll be focusing primarily on electrification, using this data to support successful electrification. Uh, this is something that we have done with fleets across the country, all worked with fleets operating in all 50 states in many different industries and applications. Um, and we've modeled vehicles from class one to class eight for electric vehicle suitability and energy demand projections uh, to plan infrastructure. So we've processed huge volumes of data. Uh, we have a really skilled team that has clean energy background uh, as well as development skills. Um, so we present our results in online dashboards um, that are really kind of driven by the user, but they're supported by our team and our consultants. Um, I 
always want to mention that we are a neutral advisor. So we don't think that um, it's electric or gas. We know there's other alternative fuels. And uh, this data is very powerful in helping you understand where electric makes sense and quite frankly, where it doesn't today. And I think probably all of us on the call are aware that there are some limitations to electrification in the port applications. Um, so as Tyler mentioned, we are here to really help people move successfully um, to fleet electrification. And at times that is advising that it may not make sense today, um, operationally or economically or both. Um, so that's a little bit about us. I encourage you to follow the link that Ann shared and, and read more about what we're up to. Um, we work directly with fleets. We work through partnerships like in utilities like Excel Energy or like the Entergies of the world. Um, we work with national labs and we're very proud of the diligent work that our team does. Next slide, please. Okay, so diving right into thinking about these powered assets um, that are operating in ports, around ports, bringing items to and from ports. Uh, as fleet managers and drivers think about the possibility of moving to an electric vehicle, uh, what we think the primary concern should be is, you know, will the vehicle meet my needs or will I be asking my driver to stop and charge? And maybe what's my tolerance for that? Or um, does that work operationally? Are we gonna have downtime moving to electric or can we continue to do our duties as we expected? Um, of course, economics are considerations and we should look at the total cost of ownership in making a decision uh, for an electric vehicle versus a gas or diesel or propane or anything else. Um, so, and then, you know, where would vehicles charge? So let's say we do find applications where electric makes sense um, operationally, economically, uh, where would they charge? When would they charge? How long would they need to charge for? And how can we plan for that? Uh, maybe with specific challenges around limited geography that, that ports sometimes offer. Um, so today I want to kind of encourage you to think about electrifying with confidence. And the way that we feel we can do that is by using uh, available data. Um, so for us, our paramount kind of data set is really vehicle operational data that's collected from devices you might know as telematics or GPS systems or AVL systems. Um, so we believe that's the best of the best, but I want to encourage uh, everyone to think about what data sources you do have available. Uh, maybe you have access to that system data and you have a few vehicles. Um, hopefully with some of the tips today, you can empower yourselves to do a little analysis on your own. Um, certainly when there's large volumes and numbers of vehicles available, that's where we really come in and shine. Um, you know, there's also uh, individuals that keep pretty detailed logs of their asset and vehicle usage. And I'll talk about some areas where you can collect data kind of beyond just mileage and routes today. Um, you know, look what's out there. There are some applications that make sense potentially in, in ports. Um, and as Tyler mentioned, they look very attractive on paper because um, they're sort of low mileage vehicles. There's lots of idling. So there's lots of potential operational savings between fuel costs and electricity costs. Um, but there are challenges as we know. Um, so see what's out there. And one of those challenges is limited vehicle availability. Um, but we are seeing yard hostlers from Orange EV and um, others making sense in some of these applications today. And then, you know, you can use the same data. If you can get a really good sense of what your energy needs are gonna be for your vehicle on a daily basis or your asset, uh, then you can really anticipate your charging needs uh, for maybe immediate goals for electrification and then future goals down the line if you plan to grow your electrification um, as electric assets over time. Uh, Tyler, please, next slide. Great. So I just wanna take a minute to really dive into what we call the energy demand modeling. Um, we work really hard to go beyond a route analysis or average mileage um, estimation to really look at the way, all the ways that energy is being used by the vehicles that we study um, and how energy use is impacted by things like varying geography. Um, so, you know, Port of Los Angeles and some of the routes that those uh, pilot trucks are running are very different in geography from those that we would find in Louisiana. Um, and those certainly have um, impacts on the energy demand needed to serve those vehicles. 
Um, so if you are looking at data that you have available or you're working with a partner, um, we certainly want to account for idle time if we can. We know there's lots of savings to be had there um, in liquid fuel consumption versus um, the electric option, the alternative. Um, and that's a really important component in uh, you know, understanding if real economic savings are, are valuable. Um, and also just accounting for those energy demands. We know that these vehicles have jobs. Many of the vehicles that we study have jobs and those jobs require additional energy. Um, so any kind of PTO engagement, um, for example, is going to draw energy potentially from that battery. So if I look just at miles, I would be missing a potentially huge component of day-to-day -day energy demand. Um, so it's important to account for those in some way. Um, you know, there is some cursory information available from a lot of the OEM providers around uh, sort of what the expected energy draw is for those, um, but certainly something you want to account for. Um, we know that uh, weight, so capacity or load, um, can all have impacts on your energy needs as well. So, you know, sometimes we might analyze large people movers, and we need to think about the weight of those people when the vehicle's fully um, fully loaded. Um, same is for cargo. So, you know, anytime you're adding weight, you're adding potential energy demand. Um, so best to account for those things if you can. Um, if you're able to access rich data sets like telematics data, we can really see with confidence where vehicles dwell, um, when and how long they dwell for. And if we can get a good handle on their energy demands, then we have a really good sense of if they have time to stop and charge and charge fully. Um, for example, and where they would naturally do that if we made no real change uh, to driver behavior. And I hit on geography. We know that um, you're going to use more energy in some fuel applications uphill or at lower speeds or higher speeds, depending on what the technology is. So the images here are simply demonstrating uh, some of the energy intensity that's being used by diesel on the left and then your kilowatt or your electric intensity on the right um, for the same trip in the same vehicle. So we're able to model out what that intensity looks like in a very granular level. Um, you know, but as I mentioned, I think even if we just have basic data available and a handful of vehicles that you're observing, you can look beyond just routes and average miles and you can account for some of these uh, auxiliary energy demands in your studies as well. Um, and I just want to mention, this same methodology can be applied to other alternative fuels. Um, so we're really just modeling energy demand here. And for today's purposes, I'm for focused more on electrification. Next slide, please. Okay, so here's an example of, you know, if you have access to a really uh, fine grained uh, telematics data set, then we encourage fleets to look at a minimum of 90 days of vehicle operation. Um, we would love to study a year's worth of data. And if you have that available, I encourage you to take a look back. Um, you know, we know that vehicle use can change seasonally. One of the other impacts I did not call out is a temperature impact. We know that the uh, extreme temperatures uh, right, can affect your range and maybe your ability to charge quickly um, in extreme cases. So it's important to think about seasonal variation in your fleet. And certainly if you have telemetry available and you have weather data available, you can account for those in your energy model. Uh, with this approach, again, we're not just looking at economic savings. This is important. And I think it's particularly important in a lot of the port applications because there are very limited models available. And some of those models come with a fairly high upfront price tag. Um, so will your vehicle actually uh, meet enough operational savings to offset that higher upfront cost of the vehicle? And if not, uh, you know, how much more marginally are we spending? Um, and, you know, could that gap be filled in with some local incentives? Um, so going through this fine grain analysis can really help you budget plan, can help you apply for the incentives that I know um, LCF talks about and um, make change if you're ready and if it makes sense operationally. Um, so again, really focused on making sure the drivers can still do their jobs um, and that there's a tolerance for midday charging if or when that is necessary. 
Um, through telematics, you can see what your estimated fuel gallon savings are, uh, your emissions reductions, then what would they be, and what your charge time and cost would be. You can project where, when, and how long vehicles will dwell and charge to refill their battery. I will touch on that a little bit more on the next slide, if you could, please. So another component, let's say you do find applications that make sense as electric vehicles and you're able to order those and hopefully you're able to get those in a few months. Um, we're all aware of some of the supply chain constraints out there today as well. Um, but let's say we do find applications where electric vehicles make sense. Um, you know, and, and we would find some that don't too. I just wanna mention that. And there are other ways to, to reduce carbon emissions on those vehicles with other alt fuels or idle mitigation. Um, but fast forwarding to, we find a few vehicles that make sense today. We really do want to know where, when, and how much those vehicles will charge. And we know that not all vehicles are going to charge in the same way and have the same energy demands. And we know that each charging location where there might be multiple vehicles using the same infrastructure are not going to have the same energy needs and the same path of growth. As, uh, as fleets continue to electrify. So each potential charging site looks very different, right? Based on the vehicles that are using that charging infrastructure, that vehicle utilization um, and operations for the fleet. Um, so it's not easy to predict in a linear fashion how to plan for load growth at each charging uh, potential charging site. Next slide, please. Uh, so really going again back to that granular data, if you have access to it, if you're able to model your energy demands on a per vehicle basis, this allows you to do some really powerful projections. Um, so here, I know this is kind of small for some of you. Um, on the right, you can see a map here. And essentially, this is tracking all the areas where vehicles would congregate and potentially plug in. This is where they're spending their long dwell periods in this instance. Uh, there are, of course, ways to capture those midday charging opportunities. In this instance, we're really focused on the 9 to 16 hour long dwell periods for vehicles. Um, if you're hot seating vehicles or these have different applications, you may want to look at a shorter window. Um, but that's what we're displaying here today. Um, on the left-hand side, far left in the bar chart, we're able to project out month over month what we're expecting our peak kilowatt demand to be based on the vehicles that we identified in this study as being potential good fits for electrification. So again, really focused on how each vehicle in, in each specific application is operating today and projecting what their energy demands would be. Um, sometimes we call this the worst case scenario, um, and we reference it in that manner because this is really the unmanaged charging projection. Um, but if we can see what would happen, what would happen if I converted these vehicles today and my drivers simply return to dwell uh, where they typically do, they plug their vehicle in and they fully charge, what would that look like? Um, and what would that impact be on my utility bill? And, and so from there, if you can see what that unmanaged projected scenario looks like, you can make decisions around the number and type of chargers that you install, um, whether you need a managed or smart charging solution. And by that, I mean everything from an employee policy to actual connected um, managed charging. Um, so really anything in between. Um, by looking at this scenario, you can make a lot of other decisions and plan for growth over time. Um, so really powerful about this data, if you have it available, is to look at what are my energy demands as I bring on one or two electric vehicles versus what would my energy demands be if I electrified all of my assets. Um, projections like that are possible with techniques like this. And I think that brings me to the end. Um, I thank you for your time, and I hope that you've taken a little something from this today around vehicle electrification for vehicles on ports or actively serving ports, um, and look forward to any questions you might have. Thanks.
Thank you so much, Mary. And I think that that, um, that presentation really sets up a lot of what we're going to discuss in the next two presentations, because really understanding what data you have and what you can do with that data is going to be absolutely invaluable in making any purchasing decision in the future uh, in any of those conversations in the future. So to talk a little bit more about the application side of things, we have Matt Meyer, the uh, sales and business development, or with sales and business development with Danar. And uh, Matt, I'll just pass it on to you to, to go through your slides. Oh, that's terrific, Tyler. Thanks for having us. Uh, you know, I think you're right. I think uh, being able to, to hear what Mary had to say and then start looking at some, some applications uh, will certainly make sense. So you can jump us right to the next slide. I really wanna start here because of, uh, I wanna speak to the fact that that these conversations for uh, for Danner with seaports and sea opera, uh, sea operations uh, is not new for us. Uh, we've been uh, we've been around as a company for about 12 years. Uh, we've been in production for about two years of our vehicle, uh, but we've been engaged, as you can see here. This is the California project in 2018, and even before that, engaged in conversations with ports and looking for solutions for decarbonization and uh, trying to be a, a support piece there. So we certainly have history there. We certainly feel like we've got some good fits there. Um, we call this the beast because you can see the big dualies and uh, all the extras that we put on here to, to kind of just to prove out uh, EV capabilities in, in daily operations. So uh, that was a kind of a couple of one-offs prototypes uh, that were built specifically for this project in California. Um, and those two, uh, the, the beasts are still operational there at the, the Port of Stockton. So uh, Tyler, you can advance us forward. Um, so Danner opted not to go into um, just uh, solely uh, a heavy duty material handling um, vehicle and machine as, as we kind of showed there in the first slide. Uh, this is our mobile power station, but we still feel like we've got an extremely effective and helpful vehicle um, for decarbonizing uh, port operations, uh, really in two ways. Uh, first being in, um, in just with the parts, the, the vehicles you see there pictured on the left, kind of dressed out for power. Uh, and then the other side of our business and the other places where we, we certainly have a fit, a unique fit in port operations is, is kind of dressed out for work there uh, as seen to the right. So I just want to give a couple of examples uh, of each and kind of where that fits. And then we're going we're gonna to kind of end with Kind of what we see is right now, at least today, summer 22, kind of our best use case in terms of uh, where we fit. So this is the, the mobile power station or what really has just become known as, as the banner out there. So, all right, Tyler, you can move this ahead. Uh, so pictured, you can kind of see the, the modular design, uh, the configurability illustrated well in those pictures. Um, but I really just want to talk about two uh, specific examples, kind of real life examples. Uh, of where we fit and in a, in a work operations in a versatile work way uh, in the ports. Um, the first one, and we've got a, a port operator that, that described us as his pull and load workhorse. Um, so uh, again, the way he described his operations for us, um, while the when a, when a big container ship pulls into his port and all, all the primary offloading of the, the major containers, the uh, out of the, the, sh the ship's hold is happening kind of amidships. So there's still a lot of work that has to be done. There's still um, a lot of uh, materials on, materials off that are going on. You know, a ship that's been out at sea for, for weeks at a time. Um, so what he does is he uses the Danner to, to tug down kind of a train of material handling um, parts and uh, positions them down to where he's going to be able to resupply all of the perishables and the consumables, all the things that the, that the ship operations need. So he's able to bring those into position and then our Danner is outfitted with, uh, with pallet forks as seen kind of in the top picture there. Uh, so he's able to detach from his train of parts and then he's got an operator that is able to unload those. And he likes to have him do that with the remote control because he's got a, a scanner on his hip. He can walk through those containers and scan all the materials on barcodes that are coming on board to the ship. And then uh, with the remote, uh, use the Danner to offload those, uh, those pallets and boxes and containers to stage them and prep them uh, for onboarding to the ship. And then um, you get all the, that, all the material that's coming off the ship um, as well. So the way he kind of described it is you got the hole and the cleans coming on board and you got the empties and, dirty, and, and dirties off uh, coming off the ship, loaded onto those same material handling parts 
Uh, he hooks our vehicle back up, and then he tugs that away uh, back to back to home base for offloading. Um, and what what's in that solution? He's able to well, he's eliminated his uh, his diesel tug. Uh, he's also eliminated uh, uh, one of his one of his needs for a, a forklift down there because we're going to double as that. Uh, and the other thing he sees in kind of looking forward and and to work, you know, kind of what the next the next step is, is he sees that being that that tug operation that loop is being an autonomous loop um, when he's ready to kind of take that step and put that package on. So we've already demonstrated through many tests, many with the Department of Defense. Um, that our technology, our data, is ready to receive those autonomous packages, and it's just a matter of finding the, the specific use cases, working with our uh, with our partners on that uh, on that side of our business, and making those things become reality. So he's seeing that not only as a decarbonization step, but a step towards uh, autonomous operations where they're going to make sense for the ports. Uh, so the second work example I wanted to, to pass on is, is somewhat similar. This is a Pacific Northwest port. And they're primarily um, exporting timber. So all day, every day, there are trucks, big trucks coming in, full of logs, and those logs get staged on the uh, on the on the port decks and the open spaces, and 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 prepped, and then ship comes in, they load up all the logs, and then those get uh, get sent off. And so, as you can imagine, those open spaces on um, on the port docks are just always full of debris, sticks, and twigs, and tree bark and, and whatever and so and that's why i chose the, the second picture there to, to illustrate this today so what he'll do is he'll hook up this this rotary sweeper attachment uh at the three-point hitch and he can run that back against uh, run that back and forth across his his open areas there at the port and keep that area clean and functional and ready to go uh, and then the next ship is is approaching it's getting close he can drive it to the side he can drop uh the a sweeper attachment, pick up a set of pallet forks, and now his danner is ready to work and, and provide material handling support to the ships in just many of the same ways that I just described. Um, and here again, this is another opportunity where when, when that port is ready to, to take the time and the, make the investment to, to do so, we can outfit his danner with uh, an autonomous package that will do that sweeping operation for him uh, without an operator. So again, moving towards first to to decarbonize, to to bring electric in, and then have opportunity to um, to take the next step uh, that we all see coming into automation and autonomous operations as well. All right, you can you can move us forward. Um, so the other the other half uh, of our business and where we certainly have a, a great fit there at uh, in in the seaports is providing auxiliary port power. Um, as pictured down below there, where you see us doing uh, doing a charge there for that van, um, that's a half a megawatt of power on board. So you got 250 kW below the deck. So on work operations, you got 250 uh, kW on board, and here you got another 250 on top. So 500 kilowatt hours of power, a half a megawatt. And uh, because we're mobile, you can take that uh, where you need it, up and down uh, your port. And because of our flexibility, you can deliver that power however it needs to come off uh, to support the, the electric or the power needs. So that would be a, you know, 120 volt, 240 volt EV charging um, can be up fit for 43 phase, which would be bi-directional. So you could use that also to charge us up. A lot of flexibility, a lot of options. Um, so as, as the, the core operators think about any place that they have power needs, and there's power being used up and down their operations. Certainly, any place where they're using uh, a diesel gen set, uh, this is an opportunity to uh, to step in and provide that power in a, in, in a quiet and clean way. Um, and then, even the places up and down the port where there is power currently, but you have to have a backup system, a backup plan, uh, should that power go out, right? So all of the gates and all the checkpoints and all the the cruise terminals, et cetera, et cetera, um, that would become a great um, backup system uh, for those uh, as well. And then um, pictured there, um, certainly our vehicle is an ideal pairing with microgrids and renewable energy uh, technologies, uh, such as you know, the offshore wind that you see pictured there, or if you have, um, you have solar on the campus um, as that gets collected up, um, that power can be downloaded you know, 
a DC to DC directly into the danner, and that, that power then can be taken and driven to where it needs to be used, or you can simply put us to work and use the power uh, directly. So a lot of options, a lot of flexibility there. Um, and then the, the next bullet point there, and this is what, uh, what Richie's going to get into next when I'm done here in a couple of minutes, um, but we've become a good piece uh, for, for the shore power. Um, what I say is kind of, a, again, fitting kind of more of an auxiliary role, right? So if you have a big container ship coming in, and again, Richie will go through some of this, but um, my half a megawatt's not going to stand up to provide all the power that that ship needs. Um, but uh, we have the option, one, of tethering my vehicles together, but more likely, and what we're actually seeing today, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look down and, and get this quoted right from the guy that we talked to at the port, is he likes the way that the Dan are able to expand the usefulness of his dock space. That's the way he said, expand the usefulness of his dock space. And what he's referencing specifically to being able to provide shore power is that where he does not have his fixed assets in place, so down to the extreme left or right of, of his operations, now we can bring a banner down there and he can bring shore power and uh, provide electricity to a smaller ship or to the tugs or auxiliary uh, boats that are, that are part of that operations of, of ships in and ships out. It gives them some of the flexibility extra um, to do that. And, and again, when Richie talks, he'll be able to kind of give you a sense of the range and, and the ships and what's what's required there for shore power. And uh, as he does that, you can you can think back and keep in mind, I'm at 500 kW today, so that'll give you a point of reference when he goes through some of that. Um, and then certainly, um, and, and not an um, insignificant piece, um, for, an, uh, for a big uh, port operation, certainly there's gonna have to be resiliency plans, emergency preparedness plans, whether it's fire, weather events, preparing for other types of outages, and again, having half a megawatt of mobile power available to be able to deliver and deliver however it's required is certainly going to be uh, a helpful piece in, in, a, in a port operations. Um, so, um, Tyler, you can advance this up. This is really where I want to, want to finish that. And, uh, my last slide that I'll, I'll sit and talk about, well, really uh, what's emerged for us is uh, I think our best use case today at Seaports is for mobile charging. And this is really interesting for, for Danner as a company, because if you talk to Gary Danner, even go back just five or six years when he was first talking to, uh, for, to ports or to um, municipalities or to airports or whatever about our vehicle, he was designing a versatile work vehicle. That was his plan. That was what was being developed. He grew up on a farm. He's in heavy equipment. This is where he cut his teeth. And this is what he was developing. But because of where the world is and because of the way electrification is has taken hold and, and we're kind of on the elbow of that, we can all feel it. Probably half of the opportunities that Danner is running into right now are simply for power. Power units that are gonna provide some additional support for typically for charging, but for other power needs as well. Um, so you think about a, a large port operation, they got this large fleet of, uh, of vehicles, essentially let's say they all started in you know, diesel and they're starting to um, electrify that fleet. Right, and and there's always that there's the need to be able to move and, and manage the, the the size of the electrical uh, of your electric fleet with your ability to charge and have the infrastructure to support that, and and we're all kind of living in that reality. It's not just reports; that's true everywhere, um, absolutely everywhere. Is we're living in the tension of those two realities, and uh, I thought Mary said it well just a minute ago. She she talked about the the need that we want to be able to electrify with confidence, right? Um, and where our confidence starts to wane is when we start feeling the tension that is between those two realities of the pressure to add more EVs to my fleet and yet have the support and the structure and the infrastructure to be able to manage that electrical need. Um, so Danner is able to slide into that, that space, into that tension and uh, provide relief, provide solutions, um, and we would say temporary solutions in a sense, but, but the reality is that gap will likely, the, the, that, that gap will likely exist for, for decades, right? Because the number of EVs on, coming online is always going to uh, be challenging and pushing the, the infrastructure timeline to support those. And where that gap is, is, is kind of where we fit. Um, so again, specific to ports, um, I, I thought this, this quote is interesting. This is right off of Wiggins' website. Wiggins is you probably know if you're in port operations and listening to this presentation, they make heavy duty material handling um, machines, right? I mean, they, 
they're all over the ports there. They're able to handle the big uh, sea containers and uh, their, their fleet of bulls. And now they have the evil, right? They're full electric option, a good machine, does a lot of good work. It's used uh, extensively in port operations. I found this quote in, on their website uh, just last week. Ebol, speaking of Ebol, it's designed for full day of operations. Well, that sounds terrific until you read the rest of the sentence. When combined with intermittent charging strategies. And, and that's kind of the fine print or the legalese um, to say, we think this is going to work for you all day. It should work for you all day, but you know what? We're not really sure. Um, or maybe maybe it works for you all day, year one and two and three, while it's operation, but as, as it gets along in years, um, now you're finding that uh, there's there's an issue there. Um, so again, this is an opportunity when when trying to electrify and trying to make smart decisions and do so with confidence, uh, that we're able to bring some mobile charging in to augment um, your fixed charging capacity um, and step into that gap and be able to do so uh, with with mobility. And that's so if I drop down to kind of kind of the final point there. Um, to save the infrastructure cost and timing. Um, and there might be a case where you get to the point where we don't have to add more infrastructure, or you may still need to add more infrastructure, but now we've got we've got some solutions in the interim. Um, and there also is all the hassles that go with that, right? It's the permitting, the regulatory stuff, the checking with the utility, do we have enough power going to be able to support it, right? Tape involved with that in the long lead times that we're all, you know, have been referencing already. Um, but even beyond that, um, again, back to the back to our example here with the um, with the evils. If you got a half dozen of these in your fleet and they're working a quarter mile down the dock, um, and those older units are, are suspect in terms of their ability to keep a charge all day, or in using Mary's technology, you're able to determine no, we're going to need to have some intermittent charging. You can drive my vehicle down there, right where they're needed, pull those offline one at a time. Give them each a half hour of charge. That extra 25 kW or 30 kW is going to carry them through the afternoon, and you can have confidence that your operations are going to stay um, stay up and running uh, and all. So um, we can add. Uh, obviously, if you're going to be doing charging, you're going to be adding a, a fast charger or a couple of fast chargers to my units. Uh, we've got units that have uh, up to six chargers on them. So think about like a um, mother cow half operation. You can have multiple vehicles uh, charging, uh, taking charge on at once, um, and we're able to even add uh, range extenders like a like a hydrogen fuel cell. Right, so if you already have hydrogen at your port to support other hydrogen uh, fuel cell vehicles you have there, then that would be a great add-on to to the Dana to to increase that um, that capacity further. And again, we say a half megawatt. Um, those of us that are in are in battery electric, we know that probably 18 months from now, right? My 500 is probably going to be 800 plus, maybe pushing a megawatt, kind of in that same that same footprint. So, um, so my hope is that you'll kind of see value um, in in pairing uh, Mary's technology and, and good telematics, good data, and, and then also having a percentage of your charging capacity uh, augmented with mobile charging to give you flexibility. And the ability to expand and uh, and uh, to move up and down your operations as the um, as the system requires uh, to to stay operational. So, uh, Tyler, that is uh, the end of my prepared remarks. So I appreciate your time and uh, your interest and and the chance to be here with you. Thank you so much, Matt. I think that was a great presentation. And um, I really like the resiliency piece that you added in there. We're going to have a whole presentation on resiliency uh, later on in the day. And I think that's one of the most important topics we could discuss here in Louisiana, as we do get hit by hurricanes very often. And that resiliency piece is really important. Sorry, I scrolled on the wrong screen there. <laughs> Next up, we have Richard Biedenharn with Intergy, who is going to talk a little bit about shore power applications and what they can do to support those projects. Richie, take it away. Thanks, Tyler. Uh, you know, my name is Richie Biedenhardt. I'm a project manager at Intergy. I work primarily on shore power and electrification, beneficial electrification for Intergy throughout the entire service territory. Tyler, you can go to the next slide. Uh, you know, shore power is uh, one strategy to help marine customers decarbonize. Uh, it is its core idle reduction technology. Uh, when ships are in port, they self generate electricity. In order to keep idle systems online, kind of like a hotel load, they call it. 
and uh, it uses a pretty significant amount of power and diesel uh, uh, emissions to to maintain these ships while they are stopped for whatever reason. It could be bunkering, loading, unloading, waiting on crew, waiting on jobs, or even for a longer term layup for maintenance and things like that. Uh, the grid itself is uh, pretty much always cheaper and uh, more efficient, at least Intergy's grid is for the, compared to self-generation. So there's some immediate benefits that I'll get into that our customers benefit from. Next slide, Tony. So uh, pretty much any sort of uh, industrial grain marine vessel can take shore power. Uh, we're not really talking about the you know residential grade you know pleasure boat shore power here. We're talking uh, 208 volts and above. Uh, cargo tankers and crews have the highest potential. Actually, uh, uh, pretty enormous emissions come from these uh, vessels and huge amount of fuel consumption while they're in port. Uh, but also, they're the most uh, you know challenging from a capital investment and engineering challenge perspective. Uh, a huge uh, market for shore power in at least our network is the offshore and inshore workboat industry. Louisiana has a huge amount of, uh, of marine industry that these vessels serve. And uh, these vessels are kind of in the middle voltage range of 280 volts, where it's a pretty materially significant amount of diesel being uh, spent while in port. And the, uh, but the infrastructure isn't prohibitively expensive either. And so we're finding a real sweet spot for our customers looking to decarbonize their supply chains. These projects can range from anything as small as 30 kilowatts to 15 plus megawatts. And you can imagine the, the differences in timeline, cost, and impact of a 15 megawatt project versus a 30 kilowatt project is pretty significant. So shore power is a very wide uh, uh, product to, to kind of explore. Next slide, Tyler. So the state has a, a huge number of ports. It's a, a very marine oriented state. So. Uh, the Ports Association of Louisiana divides all of our ports into uh, several categories. There's deep draft, which are kind of what you imagine uh, when you think of a full industrial port. That's container ships, uh, cargo ships, cruise ships coming in. Uh, we have many of those along the Mississippi River, like Port of New Orleans, uh, Port of, uh, of South Baton Rouge, South Louisiana, excuse me, Port of Baton Rouge. Others are all deep water. And then uh, secondary to that are the coastal ports, and many of these serve the oil and gas industry that Louisiana has a huge part of. So all of these vessels serving offshore rigs, uh, or they're called offshore supply vessels, there's some other types as well. Uh, they're kind of in, in the 300 foot range of, uh, of size, so pretty impressive ships, but not so big to need uh, transmission level power. And these customers are very, very, very interested in decarbonizing. They're under a lot of pressure from their stakeholders. That's customers, banks, owners are all looking at these businesses to decarbonize their operations. And shore power is just one method of doing that. And there's a couple of ports that are under development in Louisiana as well. There's the Louisiana International Expansion uh, in Violet, Louisiana, it's south of uh, the port of New Orleans. And then there's a port of Plaquemines expansion that's in the planning as well. And both of these ports have the potential to use uh, a very large amount of shore power. And we're seeing different, you know, the future proofing versus retrofits and uh, in each vessel category, it's really a different solution for each. The fundamental concepts of uh, net emissions reduction and fuel savings stay the same, uh, but the engineering challenges uh, or engineering requirements, uh, especially on the customer side, is different for each of these categories. Next slide. So what are the primary stakeholder benefits? Uh, the ports operators and all the community enjoy zero side emissions when hoteling. So uh, imagine uh, you know, burning a significant amount of diesel, keeping this uh, hotel load operable on the boat, and it goes to zero on site. That being said, there's no such thing as a free lunch. So entries, our emissions do go up a fraction of the original amount. This is called the net emissions benefit. So uh, on a recent project we did for Essence West down in uh, Fort Fouchon, we measure net emissions reduction of 98% for NOx, 48% for SOx, and 42% for CO2. So that's really an immediate benefit that our customers can benefit from as they look to decarbonize, be more competitive, and, uh, and, and, and burn less diesel. Uh, we see 30 to 60% fuel savings when hoteling. I would probably... Venture to say we're near the top of that, if not higher than that right now with $5 plus diesel. Uh, the grid itself is a much more efficient way of generating electricity than self-generation. I've mentioned a few times, but it's really important. 
This is kind of distinct from, say, shore power in California or the Northeast, where uh, electric rates are much, much higher. Our average commercial rate in Louisiana is probably hovering in the 11 cent per kilowatt hour range, which is, you know, I'd venture to say half that in California or more. And so our customers who are looking to decarbonize can deploy capital to do so, but it has a payback period as well. And that's really exciting for me to promote and for all of our customers that can benefit from that in Louisiana and Texas and our other operating areas. Beyond just the fuel savings, there's a pretty significant impact on O&M. Uh, this is based on, uh, you know, all of these power plants on these vessels are have hours-based maintenance. Uh, oil changes, uh, coolant changes, things like that are on a much more frequent scale than, say, an on-road vehicle. So when you're plugged into power, these uh, engines are all idle or, or, or literally uh, cold iron, and you don't run up those hours-based operations. So you have a couple of engineers on your vessel that don't have to spend their time changing oil, changing seals, and things like that that are all hours-based. So uh, right now, there you know there's a labor shortage in this industry, and it's one more way to maybe you know use your employees' time more valuably while you're in a, a turnaround in port. Additionally, there's less noise. We have some port facilities in our network that are in population centers and not having the, uh, the onboard power plants making noise is a big benefit. This image to the left is just, you know, to help you understand why we have these net emission benefits. Intergy's generation portfolio is kind of perfect for this type of activity. So we have a large amount, 40% in 2019, of uh, very efficient natural gas generation. Uh, the carbon intensity of natural gas generation is quite low compared to other fossil fuel sources. So we have a large chunk of nuclear, which is pretty close to uh, zero carbon as you can get for power. And then there is some coal, though that is always decreasing. I need to look at the 22, 2022 numbers on that and see where we are. But 6% coal is uh, not too bad. And then we have power purchases making up the balance. So uh, we are committed to actually making this even more uh, or even less carbon intensive. And I'll cover that a little bit later on. But you can see why that using the grid to power your vessel is a better choice from a carbon and fuel savings perspective than self-generation. Next slide. So there's two project structures. I don't want to get too bogged down on this slide, but it's in here for anybody that wants to, uh, you know, come and revisit and, uh, you know, if they're at a later date. But port ownership versus tenant ownership. In the scenario where uh, multiple different vessel operators are calling on the same shore power installation, maybe port ownership is the right approach. The port themselves would uh, sign the line extension agreement with Intergy and be responsible for. Uh, the power bill of the operations of the, uh, the equipment. And they would have some sort of secondary agreement with anybody that ties in, say, like a daily rate, a hookup cost, things like that, to help kind of recover some of that expense. Uh, you know, there's pros and cons to both of these. And the other option is tenant ownership. And we see a lot of this in the oil and gas industry, like at Port Bouchon, where the actual vessel operator or whoever is paying for the fuel of the vessel, uh, say, like, uh, uh, oil and gas services company will they themselves install the shore power equipment at their dedicated dock space. Uh, these projects are really uh, very, very cost effective in many cases, and we're seeing a lot of these done because uh, the, the, all of the stakeholders are perfectly aligned here, uh, and it's really a no-brainer. It's return to base operations of multiple vessels, uh, you know, calling on the same one or two slips, so the utilization is pretty high. So it, it's really a great uh, solution. And both of these have uh, a uh, pretty much identical, uh, you know, responsibility structure in that Intergy owns everything up to the meter. And then the customer or port or tenant is responsible for behind the meter infrastructure. So there's kind of two sides of the project, Intergy side of the electrical infrastructure, like the wires, the poles, trenching and uh, transmission and metering. And then the customer is responsible for pulling that conduit to the uh, actual vessels, and uh, you know, there we can work with our customers to help minimize those costs, place this equipment deeper in the site to where you know everybody's costs are lower. Uh, but uh, it is something to consider that there are you know requirements from our customers to kind of prepare for this type of infrastructure. So the marine landscape is changing really rapidly. Uh, when I first started getting involved in shore power a couple of years ago, there was very little. Uh, fully electric alternative fuel or, or hybrid vessel chatter on the market. I knew Norway had been operating a little bit of this type of stuff a bit, but uh, in Louisiana, we're now seeing these three options. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the battery hybrid. That's a uh, LNG slash battery hybrid offshore supply vessel. 
and around, I think it's like a 320, 330 foot class vessel. I don't know exactly uh, the vessel classification, but anyway, it's quite a large vessel. And there are immediate benefits to an operator for using a battery power, a hybrid battery power plant. So it's sort of like a Prius where overall efficiencies are immediately improved. And, and there's also some synergy with shore power in that, you know, if you set up your equipment properly, uh, you can top up that battery while they're in port. And so that battery gives them about 30 minutes of, uh, of uh, power, uh, like full power of a vessel if they're on battery only. So uh, you can kind of, you know, understand a bit how it is primarily an LNG vessel, but the battery itself is there to help provide better efficiency. The middle option is fully electric, and we're seeing this a bit in our network, a few experiments like uh, Crowley in uh, Port Arthur and maybe a few other locations. But these are harbor tugs that have uh, relatively small operating ranges. Uh, these vessels have pretty large battery packs on them, uh, and they're fully electric. And so they can go and help maneuver ships in port, uh, help guide ships down waterways and things like that using uh, you know, no onboard diesel or have no generation on board. So it, that's pretty exciting. And uh, you know, that has its own challenge related to shore power. You need a lot more power more quickly for something like this. So uh, you know, we're talking about half a megawatt megawatt chargers needed in this scenario, unless you're able to trickle charge overnight with something a little bit smaller. Then finally, uh, Maritime Partners has announced their uh, their brand new uh, they're calling it Hydrogen One towboat. Uh, Maritime Partners is based in Louisiana. And they are partnering with ABB and uh, a couple other businesses to develop this new concept. And so it's a, essentially a towboat that pushes barges long range on the Mississippi River. And instead of using straight hydrogen, they are using methanol as kind of a transitional fuel to, uh, to as a way of storing hydrogen, reforming it into pure hydrogen, sending that hydrogen into a fuel cell and generating electricity to power the boat. It sounds a little bit convoluted. I need to, you know, I want to see some actual data on the emissions uh, profile of this, but it is kind of exciting that, you know, green methanol isn't easy to source right now, but that may be something that we see Louisiana you know, position for, uh, for, you know, refining here in the state. So that could be pretty exciting for, you know, our overall, you know, industrial specialty here in Louisiana. Next slide. So I, I can't speak for every utility uh, or even every utility in Louisiana, but energy you know, the opinion is that you need to engage very early with utilities if you're looking at shore power type solutions. We want to be involved in scoping the project to make sure it's successful. Uh, you know, I don't want to be, we haven't yet luckily, but I don't want to be in the situation of having a disappointed customer by giving them the price tag of bringing 50 megawatts, you know, uh, tens of miles out to like a new facility or something like that. It can get very, very, very expensive. So, Connecting with energy early, taking advantage of our engineering expertise and project management to help scope the project from the utility perspective. Uh, we have teams who are dedicated to working with plants and, and heavier commercial customers with this exact activity that are really experts. And you can fill out transmission questionnaires and we can provide to you varying levels of precision on costs, depending on how far along you are in your project. So definitely engage with us on these types of projects. And you know we want to be there and make sure that you're successful. Uh, Next slide, please. And you know, so what exactly do you get from energy work on shore power or other you know, marine beneficial electrification project? We do have a lot of focus on the utility side project management. We're very interested in making sure these projects are successful, making sure our engineers that are local to the network understand the you know the idiosyncrasies of dealing with electrification and give that same uh, you know, safe uh, and cheapest solution to all our customers. We help a lot with site selection. I've kind of mentioned that with our uh, large project services teams. And then uh, we can also help you with emissions analysis. Uh, this is something that we're really proud of, our, our carbon intensity being so low compared to our, our peers. And our, the next slide, we'll kind of go over that a bit. But this is something that we want our customers in Louisiana, Texas, Arkansas, and Mississippi to be able to brag about, or, you know, demonstrate their carbon reduction plans using Intergy as a way to be more competitive you know, in the United States and internationally. Uh, we can help a bit with grant assistance in this process. And then additionally, uh, we are masters of the line extension policy here in the electrification teams, and we're able to work with you to make sure that you get as much credit as possible uh, and as fairly as possible for, you know, your line extensions that is putting in new poles, new transformers, and other types of infrastructure. We spend quite a lot of time in that process with our engineering teams, making sure that, you know, 
the full scope of the project is captured and that all credit can be attributed if it's applicable to uh, credits towards that infrastructure. So uh, really interested in getting involved and really helping you know, send these projects over the line. Next slide, Tyler. So Intergy, I, I kind of mentioned being a partner in your uh, in your emissions reductions journey. Intergy was the first U.S. utility to uh, voluntarily uh, stabilize greenhouse gas emissions in uh, 2001. So we capped our emissions then and have been working to reduce them ever since. So we've been uh, refining that plan to be more aggressive many times in 2006. We uh, we committed a 20% reduction through 2010. In 2011, we extended that reduction through 2020. And then uh, in 2019, we announced we're going to do a 50% reduction by 2030. And we are well on track to meet or exceed that amount. And that's really exciting to me. And finally, this bottom graph here uh, is you don't need to be able to read the words. Uh, it just kind of gives you a, a general relative carbon intensity of all the utilities uh, tracked in this report. Uh, but essentially, the y-axis is the pounds per hour of uh, or pounds per megawatt hour of CO2 generated per you know megawatt hour of electricity. So you can see that they range from the worst utility being over 2,000 pounds a megawatt hour to uh, some that are quite quite low. Those are you know mostly munis that are all uh, green. But the red the red chart or red bar, excuse me, is energy, which you can see we're in probably the top 20%. But if you were to refine this graph down to major utilities, like the top 10 utilities in the United States, we were either second or third best for carbon intensity in the United States. And we have committed the net zero by 2050. So all of your projects that involve beneficial electrification, that is something like shore power, where you're not burning diesel, propane, natural gas, or, uh, or bunker fuel, and using the grid's electricity, uh, you'll be you'll continue to benefit from our efforts and our investments to, to green our grid and provide to you net zero carbon uh, emissions by 2050. So that's pretty exciting to me. And I hope that everybody uh, you know sees the value in that. And uh, and with that, that's that's it for my presentation. So thank you for listening. And I'm always available to chat about shore power or any other beneficial electrification topic that comes up. Thank you very much, Richie. Um... Yeah, I think that was a great presentation. I really um, appreciate the all kind of panel, a lot of stuff, including some of the emissions analysis, which is really helpful from a utility perspective, because you know your load better than, or your generation profile better than anybody. Um, and having that access is really, really valuable. Uh, so we do have time for some Q&A. Um, if the panelists would like to hop back on, um, I've written down a couple of questions that, that kind of came up during the presentation and, and a couple of comments that I'd like to bring up. Uh, but if anybody has any questions in the audience, please do, uh, go ahead and, and ask those and we can address them as well as we can. I know that a couple of people down in the um, in the comments were asking questions about like what MISO is or MISO and Scott did answer that question. Um, but right off the top, one thing that I, I um, want to comment on that Mary brought up and, and I think is really relevant is that really knowing what you can do both on your own with the data that you're collecting from a telematics perspective, as well as what you can do with something more robust like what Swatch groups can do um, is, is really, really valuable. I know a lot of fleets collect telematics data, but don't do anything with them, or they're just sitting that it may not even know where that data is going. Um, and kind of understanding what you can do on your own with that is really, really valuable, I think. Um, and I think I was really, I really appreciate that, that Mary went through some of the deeper stuff that you can do uh, in terms of that. Um, and one thing that, that Mary said that maybe I'd, I'd be curious to hear a little bit more about um, that I think is really valuable is looking at uh, how mileage isn't isn't the full story. The actual miles you drive, there's there's engine run hours, there's the maintenance that you save from that, the the intensity of that that given place, um, and, and how you're actually using that those vehicles. Uh, does anybody have anything they want to add to that? Because I think that was a really valuable and kind of poignant point that people don't think about too much. I'll add, a, you know, just a little bit of context into some uh, kind of world, real world ways that we go beyond. Uh, just mileage to find fit. Um, sort of if you classically look at a lot of calculator uh, approaches with mileage estimates and um, a lot of assumptions, um, it's easy to say like, okay, I'm looking at class one vehicles. Uh, you know, we need to at least get 5,000 miles on those vehicles a year, but no more than maybe 10 or 13, because then we just, we won't be able to charge with regularity, right? And you're making these kind of broad sweeping statements. Um, we have found vehicles that drive something like 
five to a thousand miles a year that are excellent candidates because they're in very low speed, high idling applications, um, using those vehicles as mobile offices, essentially. And uh, the economics pencil out great. And midday charging, uh, what is that? You know, they don't even need to charge those vehicles daily. We have found use cases of vehicles that are 13,000, 15,000 miles um, in a minivan application for a state agency that we analyzed um, that, uh, you know, use those miles really consistently and evenly over um, that annual use. And so while a full battery electric didn't make sense in that application, a plug-in hybrid did. Um, so, you know, there's just a lot of kind of unexpected surprises that you uncover. Um, I would say conversely, we have found vehicles that slot really nicely on paper um, using a, a generalized approach. But what you find is maybe they're very heavy in utilizing their miles um, on maybe two days out of the five days of the work week. And really they would exceed their battery capacity on both of those days. They would need midday charging to complete their duties. And it wouldn't make sense for a lot of organizations today um, to ask their drivers to stop and charge uh, to that degree. Um, so we really wanna avoid mistakes. We wanna uncover areas um, where EVs make sense. And um, sometimes that's a surprise. And by going through the process, even if you know you're going electric, you can prioritize your replacements um, based on most savings and least impact to your operations. So even if you're going electric and you know it, um, I encourage doing the research and, and having a strategy. Absolutely. Does anybody have, else have anything you wanna to add to that um, before we move on there? Cool. Um, and, and Matt, for you, um, you mentioned that you had a y'all have a vehicle that was used in the um, in California back in 2018, um, and I was curious if if y'all have seen much in terms of, of battery degradation, how that's worked over the life of those vehicles, uh, how big the changes have been as well in the battery technology since 2018, uh, in like a heavy duty heavy duty application like that. Has have things changed a lot? What, how have, how has that looked over time? Well, the, the nice thing is the technology is certainly getting better. I think what we're finding is that the actual life of the batteries now those that are have good battery management systems on board is is far better than some of the stigmas that we're still trying to shake from from the early days uh, but what's interesting tyler that you bring up is specific to the off-road equipment and and those environments um, we're all kind of back on that early learning right? because most of our most of the battery electric work has been uh, on road and we have a lot of data now with a lot of history uh, we have millions, millions of miles driven uh, on electric and, and the data from those, um, but we don't have a lot of history. We have all, virtually no history in terms of real data on uh, the machine that's, you know, a backhoe and, and digging, digging holes all day. What is that going to look like? And the environments are typically pretty harsh that those are in. Um, so, uh, and the other thing that's interesting about the off-road market that we're, we're stepping into is uh, you may have days, um, and Mary kind of just spoke to this, where there's virtually, there's very little going on for maybe a couple of weeks at a time. Now, all of a sudden, that machine has to work, has to work really hard because there's some problem for three or four or five days straight, uh, you know, 12 hours, 15 hours a day. And how do we support that? And what does that mean for, for the stress that we're putting on this, those systems? So, um, yes, battery technology is much better. Yes, we're seeing less degradation than we saw years ago. Um, but start talking about some of those spaces where, where, where there just isn't much out there yet. Where we can learn from the rest of us, it's going to be interesting to watch that how that how that plays out and how that changes. There may be we may see them in, in a few years. But we're certainly staying open to it right now. We're used to the BMW i3 uh, lithium ions, but we're not beholden to BMW. Anymore. There may be um, as technology goes forward to say, hey, for off road for, for uh, construction. Utility applications. This is this is a better way to go, and so we'll be watching very closely how that how that data translates. Yeah, I think that that um, it's it's definitely been pretty stark how how quickly the battery technology has been improving over time. Yeah. Uh, it's been pretty dramatic to watch, uh, both in applications and also just from kind of an outside perspective as the whole industry shifts around. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think the last thing that I really wanted to, to kind of pitch before we kind of go to closing is, um, Richie, one, one thing that I was curious about on the shore power side of things is, you know, how, how did the kind of 
economics of shore power and the benefits of shore power scale with, with size, with installation size. They said that they go all the way down to somewhere in like the 60 kilowatt ballpark up to like 15 megawatts. Um, is, you know, is one scale of a project more attractive from a cost effectiveness return on investment standpoint than another, or are they all pretty, pretty attractive in many situations? And I apologize, they're con doing construction right above me. They just started during this presentation. <laughs> so hopefully it's not too loud. Uh, I, I can hear you just fine, Tyler. And uh, that's a great question. And so much of it really depends on site specifics, but I'll kind of talk broadly in that, you know, for a lot of beneficial electrification, the more energy that you're replacing, you know, the more money you're saving. Uh, so there's a, a definite benefit towards the larger projects. Though when you start to get into a transmission scale project, your uh, timeline now becomes several years. Uh, there's an actual full-on engineering project involved with putting in maybe even a substation. Those economics, I'm not going to say they're challenging. It's just a whole other scale. Uh, you're talking about kind of almost a planet level decision. Uh, we're finding kind of a sweet spot in these medium-sized projects, the half a megawatt to two megawatt, maybe three megawatt range, where we're often finding that there is reserve capacity on the existing circuits where these can be integrated in with a very minimal amount of infrastructure. And the economics on those really, really make sense. So, you know, that's definitely the most attractive project if you're just looking at straight return. Uh, but I'm not saying those larger projects aren't uh, very, very lucrative as well. It's just a whole nother level of consideration. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And, and the fact that the lead time is a lot longer for some of those really big projects um, is, is maybe not too surprising, but it's interesting to think about. And it's also one of those situations, just like we we're talking about the grant webinar earlier this morning, uh, planning planning six months ago is probably the right time to start, if not earlier than that. And the second best day is today, right? Uh, so especially for a long, long lead time project like that, getting getting started early is, is a good idea. Um, does anybody else have anything that y'all want to add in closing before we wrap up for the day? We're actually a little bit ahead of time, which is always a treat. Hey, Tyler, I'd just like to add uh, for, for those that are considering the next steps into um, moving out of diesel, moving into alternative is, is just keep in mind um, all of the, there's one thing just to, to change and to, uh, to go from diesel to electric, just change the power plant, so to speak, and what's powering your vehicle. Um, but I would encourage those to, to just keep in mind all the other technological enhancements that are coming as part of this wave and, and to be mindful that you ideally are making choices that are going to be able to support and, and participate in all these other technologies and things that are coming up, like the, like uh, being able to generate good telematics and good data, like being able to be flexible and multi-use, like being able to handle autonomous operations, uh, like being able to handle adva advanced and enhanced safety features. These are all ways that over the last decade, we've seen automotive change completely beyond just going from gas to electric. There's all these other things that we're seeing coming on in automotive, and that's the, those, those technologies, that change is coming to the ports, it's coming to utilities, it's coming to the off-road spaces. Um, so, so simply to, to just change from, you know, give me a vehicle that does exactly the thing that my old 1980s diesel did, but now it's electric, in a sense you're still falling behind it. You're missing some of those other technologies that are really changing the landscape. Very well said. I definitely, uh, yeah, an all of the above approach, especially in, in thinking about how the whole market's going to change right. and how you can change operations to fit with that and not just shift things over, but improve the entire yep. system altogether, I think is a very, very good point. Very good point. So Tyler, can you tell us about the next session and show the information about that? Yes, I can. I'll make sure that I get the right one up. There we are. So I do have a second copy of the presentation going so I can look ahead. Um, I do want to comment that we will have this posted, uh, this recording posted on our YouTube channel um, pretty shortly, probably early next week. Uh, so you can find all of our recordings there. We do have this great grant webinar that we hosted in March if you're interested in uh, reading through that or watching through that and then our presentation from earlier today too for grants. Um, and then we have a fantastic presentation coming up after this, it's probably the one I'm most excited about from this whole week. And we touched on a lot of these topics early today. We have a whole panel on resiliency in alternative fuels and making sure that as we deploy these projects and deploy these vehicles, we do it in a way that um, 
contributes to our resiliency of the transportation network in the Louisiana, especially because we do get hurricanes and making sure that we can evacuate safely and be really prepared for these disasters is incredibly important. Um, and we have a really, really great panel for that and I'm very, very excited. Uh, there's a registration link on uh, here, but you already registered for this webinar, so I'm sure you could find it there as well. Uh, hopefully see you all later on there. And that'll be the last, the last presentation of the summit. And we have our contact information here. So thank you all so much for coming. And with that, we can call it a call it a session 10 minutes early. Thanks, Tyler. Thank Thanks, Sam. Appreciate thank you all so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. See you all at the next webinar. Thank you.